Frigidaire. We introduce the first home freezer. The first pulsator agitator washer. And now we introduce the Frigidaire Orbit Clean Dishwasher, designed with a unique wash arm that gives you four times more water coverage for a consistently better clean. Frigidaire, over 90 years of legendary innovation. See the full line of Frigidaire appliances at Ventura TV Electronics and Appliances. Hi, I'm John Mallows. Welcome to this live edition of Connect With Me on the showroom floor at Ventura TV on this day. Today we got a couple of topics. Uh, quite a few guests in the studio today. We're talking about a business going brown, not green. And in the second half of the program, the Napa earthquake. We'll have an expert in the house talking about that. 436, Me TV Option 11. Do call in. Do turn down the sound. Back in a moment. Back here on the program, connect with me on the showroom floor at Ventura TV on MeTV Fresno, of course, as usual. We're here for the full 60 minutes today, 10 to 11 o'clock. You can call in at 436 MeTV Option 11. Today we're going to be talking about the environment. We'll be talking about water conservation and the shortage of water. We're in the middle of a drought right now. On top of that, in the second half hour, uh, we're going to be talking to an expert, a geologist who knows all about earthquakes. He predicted this one uh, that, that happened uh, over the weekend. He didn't exactly specifically predict the date, but at some point, you know, he knew that one of these smaller faults was going to cause a major problem uh, over in the Bay Area. It certainly did uh, over the weekend in Napa, causing millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of damage. We'll talk to him about that and even have a phone call come in from Napa. One of the business owners there will explain what happened to his business. But the big drought of 2014, it continues. It lingers on and on with no sight in end. you got to wonder, how much longer is the city of Fresno uh, going to go without actually imposing a very strict water rationing program. Let's go to the videotape. You know, some people around the Central Valley and the city of Fresno, well, they're self-imposing themselves with those restrictions on their homes and their businesses. Hey, like this one near the intersection of North Selland and Marty. You're looking at it right there. The owners of Stanton Printing are going brown. I mean, all brown, my friends, all brown. In fact, the new green uh, is brown, and they are challenging other businesses in the area to do exactly the same thing. They are saving all of us water by letting the lawn around the structure go brown. That's the inside of the structure. No watering of any kind. And their grass is nearly all brown already. Um, and the idea came from one of the owners, John Larson, who actually drove by one of the reservoirs and couldn't believe his eyes because it was nearly dry. This is the inside of the building here. We all assume that water is always going to be there because it always has been. But I'm telling you, my friends, it may not always be there in the near future. In fact, in a contest created by the two owners of Stanton, they will be giving away a copier and a desktop printer in a drawing to the business that saves the most water. That's coming up in December, so you could be getting one of those very expensive machines for free come December. Live in our studio right now is John Larson and Patrick McNulty. They are the owners of Stanton Printing here in the city of Fresno. They're challenging you, my friends, at home. If you own a business, if you own a home, to go brown. You know, I was out walking around my neighborhood last night, and I saw, you know, I saw a lot of, I saw a lot of lawns that were super green. They almost looked like the masters of the U.S. Open. There's a lot of water going into those lawns to make them green. I saw very few lawns that were actually all brown, maybe one or two throughout my entire neighborhood. Mine is about half brown. Anyway, we're back with our two guests, John and Patrick, here on the program. Connect with me on MeTV Fresno, 436 MeTV Option 11. 
do call in. We're back in just a moment. From now on, when I sneeze, I'll try to sneeze more friendly. <laughs> Back here on the program today. Remember, we're here until 11 o'clock, the first half hour. We're going to be talking about this, uh, the new Green is Brown campaign. Are you doing that around your house or your business? And also the second half hour, we're talking uh, with a geologist here from Fresno State about the Napa earthquake that took place uh, over the weekend. So John and Patrick are here. So the eco-friendly mentality. I guess you guys have adopted that. You're kind of self-imposing yourselves, I guess, with this this water rationing program. How'd this start, John? Um, well, everything down in Fresno that runs this whole area is built on the ag industry, and uh, so saving water in this area is especially important. Um, but I come down to Fresno to our office every other week, and I always pass. A number of reservoirs on the way and and there's the one that you pass all the time right what's the yes, name of that one there that's a uh, new Malones reservoir uh, the three fingers of the Stanislaus River feed that uh -huh. and uh, I lived above that viewing that water for 12 years but I've been going by that area for the past 30 years but I go by it every time I'm coming down to Fresno and um, what, what brought it on was late June of this year. Um, I passed by it and I couldn't believe how low it was. And I was mm -hmm. thinking to myself, well, what's it gonna look like come October? And uh, two weeks later, going back down, I passed it again. And it was lower than I thought it'd be in October. Yeah. And it really freaked me out. So when I got <laughs> down to Fresno, um, I got together with uh, Patrick and some other people there and I told them that I thought we need to do something that would save water because of how important it certainly is down here but let's everywhere. Put, let's put that picture back up just for a minute there and um, is that the water line uh, that I see there uh, uh, about maybe a quarter of the way up? Yes. It is. That's normally where the water would be in that, a normal that is year. That's high, high water mark uh, but I would say basically Three years ago, it was at that. And you can see on the right-hand side, uh, the little road uh, that's yes. down there. Yeah. And that is, I fish a lot, and that's a whole cove right there that's usually underwater, and my fish finder usually says, oh, about 150 feet. And it's well beyond that cove. The, um, I don't know if we have a picture of the bridge or not, but the bridge that we go over, um, a number of years back, I was about on my float to about 20 feet from the bottom of the bridge. Yeah. And right now it's got to be 300 feet. All right. So you started this idea. Let's roll a videotape. The eco friendly facility over there at Stanton. And so, you, so after passing this reservoir, you came up with this idea. Now, wh what are we looking at here? That's the inside of a restroom. Is, is that is that at your facility there? Yes. All right. So what's going on here? No, I don't know. <laughs> We've, the, in the rest. So what would you do? Like completely shut all the faucets down? They don't work or no, what? No, no. We've actually uh, the couple things that we did in the restrooms is we we've got all low flow toilets in the restrooms. Okay. Um, and we went went as far as changing out the type of soap that we use. We've got you know those fake trees, by the way. Yeah, yes. Yeah, they're plastic they are. trees. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's uh, but yeah, we went as far as even changing out uh, the soap to a foaming hand soap that rinses quicker. Uh, so you're using actually a little bit less water, just washing your hands every day. We've got 20, 23 employees, uh, you know, that are passing in and out of there all day long. Um, mm -hmm. So, the, you know, the restrooms do get some use, and every little bit helps. Okay, so this is the inside of your, your facility here. Do right. you think you've gone a little bit too far with this? Uh, and I'm sure we have other video that shows your grass going brown. Is that true? Yeah, we do. Um, so this is the inside of your building. but you have decided to not water your lawn on the outside. I know we're looking at the inside. I hope we can look at the outside too and see what's going on there. 
but have you gone a little too far with this thing? Uh, I don't think so uh, whatsoever. We, we switched everything in that whole uh, subdivision of businesses that was built. I think we had our building built in 2000, 2001. The, uh, the whole irrigation system is ridiculous. They're all on risers instead of drips. So what we did was we replaced all our, for all our shrubs, trees, plants, we put drip systems. So they're actually getting watered much more thorough and efficient Yet our water capacity or our water usage for the last month went down 59%, which, and- And how so, much water have you saved in that amount of time? Uh, 26,000 gallons for the month. And that'll be at least every month. How did you calculate that? How did I, I got the bill from the utility company and I went from the month before. So I went from June 16th to July 15th. I compared it to then and actually July 16th to August 15th is a much hotter month even. Right. So we, we went from um, 5,900 cubic feet of water for irrigation to 24. And there's all these business I know in that subdivision that could be doing this because of the way the systems were put in. And it's something very simple we did. Uh, Patrick installed it. We it that's was, the drip system right there, right? right. For the, for the was, plants and the, the, the shrubs and all that for a 20,000 square foot building that runs down both sides of the building, which is what about 200 feet long, Patrick, right. on each side, on each and then side. the frontage it was less than $600. But have people taken notice of this? Um, or are you doing this, you know, not undercover, so to speak, but you're, you're out there, but how many people actually know you're doing this? Well, so that's other what people we're trying to do. You're trying to get the word out there by, by how, other than coming on this program? Well, so what we came up with was a program called Copy, and it's conserve using owners' properties and yards. And so once we did this, we decided we wanted people to try to copy us. And it just works well because we sell copiers. But it's very important. We need to understand that, especially in Fresno, that all these businesses basically make it because of the ag business. And there's, what did we read? There's hundreds of thousands of crops or acreage that is not being planted because right. of the cost of the water and what have you. But um, yeah. these small things can be done and really add up. So we'd like people to sign up on this, take a pledge, and, and copy us and do this. It's something very small that if we can get enough people to do, can make, really make a difference. And even uh, if it wasn't a drought, it should be done. Yeah, well, we should have been saving water all along. Right, <laughs> I would agree. Right. Would agree. Should have been storing it, and then we'd have it right now in, in the middle of this uh, major drought that seems to be lingering on and on. John Larson, Patrick McNulty are our guests uh, here from Stanton Printing. They are challenging you to save water. They've already saved about 26,000 gallons in just a span of a month or so. You can do the same, and you can call us at 436-METV, option 11, if you want to call in, ask a question. Back with our program in a moment. Considering solar? Whether you're ready to buy now or just exploring your options, the consultants at Solar Negotiators are here to help you. A call to Solar Negotiators is like calling five solar companies at once. You see, when local established solar contractors have gaps in their schedule, they call Solar Negotiators to fill them. Right now, get five years of panel cleaning and maintenance or $1,000 off your new solar panels. So stop wasting your time searching and call Solar Negotiators because when contractors compete for your business, you win. Back here on the program, got a call coming in. Good morning, you're on the show. Caller, go ahead. I discovered something this year. I about oh, six years ago, the birds planted me six little trees, and they're about two inches tall. Now they're about 15 foot tall, but I haven't watered them all summer. I've been water watching the little grove, and they're Chinese pistachios. I didn't realize they were so drought tolerant. If we, I've been trying to plant drought tolerant for 20 years, and I've even gotten fights over homeowners association wants to make you have a lawn. You can have a beautiful yard if you just look around at what kind of plants there is that live in places like this, basically, and they look beautiful. You can go to the foothills and see beautiful plants. Yeah. And another thing I finally started doing, 
My little shower head is only about an inch in diameter, and I never paid too much attention, but now I do. It has a button on the side. You can push that button, lather up all you want to, push it back the other way, and rinse. I probably save enough to water all the drought tolerant lawn with a weak shower. Wow. But okay. you don't have to, it doesn't have to be brown, really, to have a beautiful yard. Eventually, okay. you will probably all change over to something that's drought tolerant and then will keep its beauty. Yeah. Well, those are, those are pretty good tips right there. And like I said, uh, last night during my walk, I did see most of the, gra uh, the, the lawns that I saw were green. I mean, I, I don't know if that, what that tells you. That tells me they're using quite a bit of water to keep it looking like, you know, the 16th green at the Masters. I mean, it's right. just looked beautiful, some of these lawns. And I'm going, wait a minute, are we in a drought? Right, right. <laughs> you know, so, yeah. so do you see people wasting water? Absolutely. I mean, we were one of them, uh, you know, just in our neighborhood. Uh, you know, one of the things that we, we discovered uh, is that uh, our lawns were being watered in the evening. So we're there 8 to 5, well, 7 to 7 sometimes for me, myself. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, so you don't, you don't see the sprinklers go off. You know, it, it happens in the middle of the night. And uh, so you don't see if there's any breaks. You don't see, you know... Unless you're on top of it, unless you're aware of it, you don't see a you leak know. or or maybe right. a broken sprinkler uh, head. Uh, yeah, broken. You know, yeah, that's exactly. right. Exactly. That's you right. Know, and some of the evenings that I've been there, you know, I can see uh, you know other neighbors' uh, sprinklers going off, and they'll go off every night. Um, and and we were the same way. We had it set up to where uh, you know our programmer for for our irrigation system was watering you know uh, was it, two hours a night, a night. You know, and it was just, it was crazy. I thought each station was supposed to be no longer than like 15 minutes. Well, and that's it. There we Maybe had multiple, 10 minutes or well, something. Well, we had multiple stations. And yeah. so if you, you know, each you know, station 12, would go. Maybe 12 minutes, let's right. say, on average. Okay. Right. Exactly. So how many stations did you have? So we had uh, four. four stations. All so, right. right. 12 four times stations, four. 15 minutes, yeah. Yeah, so two hours is way too long. And so you, right. you know, being the owner, I own the building. I have a contractor, the landscaper, so I basically yeah. have in my head, well, this stuff's being taken care of. Don't right. worry about it. But I think what the point Patrick was trying to make there is that homeowners that have people that take care of their lawns for them or business owners that own the building that have landscapers take care of it, don't assume because of what Patrick said, the water goes on at night, they will fix repairs, but you basically need to tell them if there's a repair. So what people need to do, especially if they have people that take care of it, they can't assume they have to go out and turn that system on once a month and check to see if there's leaks. Is it actually hitting the spots that you want it to hit? Mm -hmm. And certainly change any risers over to drip uh, because yeah. Patrick and I have seen a, a huge change in how much water we use. Yeah, what you're saying is uh, as we roll another piece of videotape here, um, do not turn over your watering system to a gardener and just assume that he's doing the job because quite frankly i mean no, no offense but what does he or she care whether or not you're wasting water right right it's right. sad to say but it's probably true we probably true and so if you, if you have a contract with somebody you kind of just let it go out of your mind and like patrick said the water does come on typically at night and so those people that work on it don't see that all right what are we looking at here my friends Oh, so this is uh, not necessarily water related, but it does have to do with recycling. So this is uh, what we call our second warehouse where it's uh, essentially the boneyard. And this is where all copiers go to die and get dismantled and separated uh, into circuit boards and, you know, aluminum and metals. And, and they go plastics. into the recycling program, right? Exactly. Okay. And so, uh, and then we've got, you know, cardboard all these copiers are shipped in the cardboard right. boxes, so we break down all these cardboard boxes, uh, recycle those. Uh, there's wooden pallets uh, that, uh, you know, those copiers come on that uh, we uh, have uh, actually an individual that comes by and picks up those, those pallets for us and, yeah. uh, and recycles those pallets. But you're going to be doing that anyway because there are certain state maybe uh, statewide regulations that, that you have to recycle these, these machines, right? I'm sure there are. I'm not aware of them. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh, you're you're doing this voluntarily then? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. So, yeah. where do those where do those machines end up? 
where do they go after they they go into the dead pile? Well, after they go into the dead pile, like I said, they get dis dismantled, separated uh, right. from plastics and metals and and boards, and then there's there's uh, uh, different recycling locations that will take those certain things. Uh, there's, I mean, one even of the, certain colored plastics, even certain colored plastics, exactly. Uh, a lot of those machines have uh, what they call a photoreceptive drum. Uh, oh, I see. And uh, those can't go into a landfill. They've they've got to be okay. taken care of separately. Yeah. All right, caller, go ahead. You're on the air. Oh, hi. I have a, a quick question. Um, you were talking about giving away the coffee -er, and I just <laughs> want to know if that was open to anybody, or? See, you start talking about giving things away, and the calls start coming <laughs> in. Yeah, but, no. Uh, uh, what's your name, ma'am? My name is Isla. Isla. Okay, she wants to know about your copier giveaway program. Hey, you're giving one of those away up on your screen right there. Talk about the program that you're you're conducting right now, and it has to do with water rationing. Go ahead. It does. Uh, so what we're doing is, in order to get people aware uh, of uh, what we're trying to do, we want to get them sign on board with copy us, essentially, the copy uh, throwdown, I guess we could call it. And... Uh, what we want to do is get people to our website. There's a quick little sign-up uh, form on there. You know, say who you are, where you are, uh, put some comments in there that some of the things that you're doing to conserve water, um, and that's simply all you need to uh, to get on board uh, to get eligible to win a, a copier or a printer. Um, we're going to be giving away a uh, full color copier, full color black and white, commercial grade copier to uh, to a business uh, that signs up, and then we've also got a. Uh, a uh, 37 copy minute uh, laser printer, desktop laser printer for an uh, individual homeowner. And so when you say sign up, what do they have to do? This this young lady wants to know what she has to do to, to enter the program. Okay, what you do is you, you go to our website. Right on the front page, you're going to see the uh, the copy program right on the front page of our website. And which is what? Address. Which is at stantonomc.com. That's okay. S-T-A-N-T-O-N-O-M-C dot com. Okay. You go to that website. Uh, you click on the link under the copy program. There's a quick sign up. It's only a few fields, um, and then you're, 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 that's it. You're entered in. And then what we'll do is uh, towards the end of the year, uh, December 1st, we're going to hold a drawing based on the applicants that we got, uh, and take a look at. Um, you know, we're going to do a random drawing. Take a look at uh, say you know, just exactly what we did. We take a water bill from you know, previous month to the next month and see that there was a considerable amount of uh, a water And whoever savings. saved the most water gets the, gets the copier and the printer. You got it. Okay, and that takes place December the 1st at your business located uh, where again? 4312 North Selland in Fresno. Okay, and that's near uh, Marty and Selland. Yeah, right, right off Shaw. Yeah, right, right off, off Shaw, Shaw. Between Abbott, Shaw and yeah. Ashland. All right, another piece of videotape I want to roll here. We have many uh, on hand here today. We even have <laughs> You know, we have still pictures, and so this is, um, uh, what is this, the back room here, guys? Yeah, again, those are showing bins right there where we're separating out the plastics mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the circuit boards um, and uh, an old barbecue. I'm not sure why that's there. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, right. that's, that's What do you do with the right. ink? The ink cannot be recycled, obviously, and where does it go? Well, the ink actually is, is a powder-based you know, polymer toner that actually gets used. I mean, that's what ends up on your paper uh, when you make a copy. Okay. Okay, so there, there are the plastic receptacles, and those can be recycled. Okay. Some, as a matter of fact, can actually be uh, remanufactured and put back out on the market. All right, call, another call coming in. Good morning, you're on the air. Go ahead. Hi, uh, good morning. Uh, I think this water crisis is so bad that I've gotten on board with this uh, conserving water. Yeah. Started with a shower, so I have sons and grandsons that they turn on the water, and let it, they used to, they let it run for a little while, and then they get in and take anywhere from a 15 to 20 minute shower. <laughs> that happens no more. I told them, I said, from now on, you get in the shower, turn on the shower, get under the uh, the shower head, get wet all over, turn off the water, shampoo your hair, um, yeah. lather your body, turn on the water and rinse, and that's it. They must be related to my kids. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? It's worked because uh, at first they didn't think they could do it. You know, they were so used to taking such long showers. And I said, listen, we're in a water crisis. And also uh, myself, I wait until I have enough clothes to put on, you know, one load of wash, and then I do it. Yeah. But we're, And then I live in an apartment complex so that they come every three months and check under the, you know, the drains, make sure that they're not leaking. 
and make sure that that's not happening. Yeah, that's the other thing that, that we didn't talk about. I appreciate the phone call, and you should do that with your families. Tell your kids, you know, in and out, five minutes, you're done. I mean, um, <laughs> you know, I mean, these the, the, the days of 20-minute showers are long gone. Right. You know, but uh, the other thing is to check under your sinks to see if there's any leak. Uh, because that can make your water bill go up. Right. Depending yeah. on how big the leak is, and even if a sprinkler is leaking outside, that can certainly cause your water bill right. to go up. I don't know. Do we have that drone shot of Millerton Lake by any chance in the city? We don't. Okay, we're going to go to break because if uh, we've shown this many times, I, I know you know how bad the drought is, but when you see Millerton Lake and even up in Sacramento, Folsom Lake from like two years ago, compared to what it looks like now, bone dry nearly. It's not totally bone dry, but very little water there. Back in just a moment here on Connect With Me. When you're looking for KitchenAid innovation and quality, who has the answers, the selection, the price? Ventura TV Appliance. With billions in nationwide appliance buying power, more than Home Depot and Best Buy combined will help you save. Our low prices on Energy Star qualified KitchenAid appliances save you energy and money and pay no interest on select models when paid in full within 12 months. Ventura TV Appliance, serving you since 1951. <laughs> Got a call coming in right out of the break here. Good morning, caller. What's your question? Good morning. You're talking about water concerning. The you even done the courthouse at night? You have to see the sprinklers on down there. It's running in the gutters. Well, we need. Hey, where is the where is the water police when you need? You know, we had the water police from the city of Fresno here. I forgot her name uh, just offhand just a couple of weeks ago, and she was, you know, uh, talking about water conservation, what you can do. Call the city. You know, if you're seeing somebody abuse the system and wasting water, like at the courthouse, where's the water police? I don't know. If you were doing it, they'd call they'd call the water police on you, wouldn't they? I would imagine so. Yeah, be yeah. Out of luck for sure. Yeah. What, what time? What time of day or night is this? I'm assuming it's at night, right? As late at night, you know, I, I go down there to Club One once in a while, uh -huh. and I see it on at like two, three o'clock in the morning. Wow! And that's when people's systems are on. Yeah, and yeah. You know, we just need to take it seriously. It's just in everybody's favor. And if it, you know, when I was calling the Fresno Utilities, uh, I was asking if people were talking about it there. And that's Millerton, by the way, as we're looking at that. Go ahead. And uh, they said, no, the more people are talking about how their bill has gone up because of the price increase in July. And I actually think, well... It's going to go back down because they rescinded that. Well, I think it should go up. If, if that's the only way we can get people to conserve, uh, when you hit them in the pocketbook, it gets their attention. Um, and unfortunately, yeah. it's come to that, but because I don't know if people are taking it seriously, but we sure would like them well, to. Well, like I said at the beginning, I think we kind of all assume that water is always going to be there, but what do we do in drought situations? You know, a lot of people think that we ought to build another dam and and store more water and not worry about what's going you know on downstream we waste a lot of water that's going into the bay area or the uh, san francisco bay good morning caller what's your question yeah i just wanted to make a statement these guys are awesome what they're doing and the fact that they're doing it on their own it just only shows that the people in this valley are really good people and we just need to keep working together but stan you guys kick off our it's really good. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, hey, the federal courthouse, shame on you. Two o'clock in the morning, wasting that water. What's wrong with you people? We need the water police out there. Hey, I want to put up the uh, disclaimer real quick because you only got a couple of minutes left here. And I want to thank the uh, people from uh, the Stanton Office, office Machines to come in on the program today. We asked them to come in voluntarily. They're not paying us. We're not paying them. And we want them to be as successful as we have been here. Uh, at Ventura TV since 1951. We wish them the best of luck and success in their water conservation program. And so you take the, ch you've heard of the ice bucket challenge. Well, hey, <laughs> how about the water conservation challenge right here on Connect With Me. Try saving water and we'll all be better off in the long run. John, Patrick, we're out of time, sadly, but you know what? Come back, guys. Thank you. We'd love to Thank have you, you back sometime. Thanks, Remember, John. brown's a color too. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> really? Well, it <laughs> depend, depends on what you're talking about. Anyway, uh, we won't go any further with that comment. We're <laughs> yeah. going to be back with more of Connect With Me, and we're going to be talking about the earthquake that took place in Napa. Are there more quakes to come? We have an expert of our own in the house, and he'll tell us all about it. Back in just a moment. That's cool.
When you like Ventura TV Appliance on Facebook, it's nice. But when you love the Frigidaire Gallery appliances we deliver, it's even better. Our website is cool and it's a good place to start, but you really should touch the merchandise before you buy. Time for that upgrade to an Energy Star qualified French Door Frigidaire Gallery Refrigerator. Quality appliances for the way you live. Get the best selection, price, and service in town without waiting. Come in to Ventura TV Appliance and touch the merchandise. Frigidaire. It means the first electric refrigerator. The first compact electric range. Now, there's the Frigidaire Gallery Range with Symmetry Double Ovens. It's designed to cook multiple dishes at multiple temperatures so you can prepare the entire meal at the same time. Frigidaire. Over 90 years of legendary innovation. See the full line of Frigidaire appliances at Ventura TV Electronics and Appliances. Frigidaire. It means the first electric refrigerator. The first compact electric range. Now, there's the Frigidaire Gallery Range with Symmetry Double Ovens. It's designed to cook multiple dishes at multiple temperatures, so you can prepare the entire meal at the same time. Frigidaire. Over 90 years of legendary innovation. Hey, back here on the program, some technical difficulties. Uh, once in a while, they occur here on Connect With Me. You know, we can't do anything about those gremlins, my friends. They just crop up once in a while, and you, you just can't uh, have any control over that. Anyway, we're going to kind of change topics here. We're going to talk about the earthquake that took place uh, over the weekend in the San Francisco Bay Area, specifically Napa. This was a 6.0 quake the biggest that hit the Bay Area in 25 years. I want to put up the first video of the fault that uh, along that fault line, it was a smaller fault line that actually uh, uh, caused this one. This one hit right around 3.30 in the morning along the West Napa Fault, a smaller and less publicized fault line than the San Andreas. In the last couple of days since the initial quake, there have been dozens and dozens of aftershocks rattling nerves around the area. Let's roll another piece of videotape. You'll see some of the damage in Napa. Look at that. That's from a drone taken in Napa just a couple of days after. You can see the damage there. Last big quake to shake the Bay Area, 1989. It happened at the beginning of Game 3 of the World Series at Candlestick Park. You may recall that. But unlike back then, this one did not kill anyone, at least not yet, although nearly 180 people injured, three of them critically so far. Fifteen buildings in downtown Napa were damaged. Ninety to a hundred homes, maybe even more, were also hit hard to the point where no one could actually go inside. The quake obviously shattered glass, facades, bricks came tumbling down, barrels of wine came tumbling down off the shelves, and some reports uh, indicate the losses could be adding up to over a billion dollars. Losses, of course, in, in many, many uh, bottles of wine that also came crashing down. The governor of California, Jerry Brown, declaring a state of emergency. Now it's time to clean up, rebuild, and start over in the town of Napa until the next quake. Look at that. That's from a drone. Incredible video there coming out of Napa. Live in our studio right now is, and I hope I get his name right, and he will correct me if I am wrong, John 
Waka Bayashi, a geologist, a professor at Fresno State, an expert, my friend, a man who actually predicted at some point this would happen along that fault line in Napa, not the San Andreas Fault. That is the big one. He'll explain that when we come back here on Connect With Me, 436 me TV Option 11. We also have somebody calling in from Napa in a few minutes to talk about the damage to his business. But our guest today, John, will explain exactly how this happened. Back in just a moment. Ventura TV Appliance Center. We're the save energy, save time, save money place. The Energy Star qualified, ready, steam equipped, high efficiency Frigidaire Affinity Place. You heard right. Right now, save big on select Frigidaire laundry pairs and pay no interest when paid in full within six months. At the hometown low price, think outside the big box place. Since 1951, Ventura TV Appliance Center, we're working hard to be your place. All right, back here on the program, talking to John Wakabayashi. Did I get that name right? Yes, you did. Hey, pretty it's good. It's all phonetic. You know, it's phonetic, but you know, first try, not yeah, too bad, huh? Yeah, yeah, hey, yeah. thanks for taking the time to come in. I know you're busy over at Fresno State. I did talk to you briefly on the telephone yesterday. Um, how did this happen and why? Now, you, I said you predicted this back in 1999. Um, in the late 90s, not this specific date it would happen, but at some point you felt that, that uh, the West Napa Fault would give way, right? Yes, well, I, I guess this, this, I can clarify that, that in, in, when we study earthquakes and we study the, the hazards posed by them, we are not at a point where we can make predictions, not within a day interval, not within 10 years even. Really? We, we can, we're not that good. Okay? But what we can do is that we can look at, at various types of data right, that give us some indication of the likelihood of an earthquake. Okay? And so what it comes down to is what we as uh, seismic geologists do is we can help the public prepare. And that's what this is all about, is to minimize the damage and the casualties in an earthquake is more knowledge helps us to prepare better rather than to predict. So when it said that I sort of, quote, predicted this, the, the only thing that I, I can lay claim to is that I believe before others did that there was a zone of faults through this area uh, that was more active and more likely to cause major earthquakes then was appreciated at that time. And so specifically that, the West Napa Fault. And where did you kind of make this prediction? During a con major conference among geologists or what? Well, it, it was, wasn't so much the West Napa, but it's a zone of faults that, that runs from the what we would call the East Bay, say from the vicinity of Walnut we, Creek. We, we've got a full um, screen that shows a lot of those faults that, that, that maybe we're talking about. We do have a phone call. Let's put the, the, these are some of the California faults that we're talking about. San Andreas, the West Napa, and you're familiar with the other ones. I'm not. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, John. Right. So when we talk about uh, earthquakes in California, and particularly coastal California, we should be aware that these earthquakes occur on these faults where one piece of ground moves past another. Okay? And so we refer to coastal California, which is a whole network of faults, as the San Andreas Fault System. That is not a single fault, but it is multiple faults, of which the San Andreas Fault itself is the most active. So what do I mean by the most active? This means that if it produces the most major earthquakes per a given mm -hmm. interval of time, say yeah. within several hundred years, the biggest number of major earthquakes will be expected on that. That is because the long-term movement of the San Andreas is faster than the other faults. But it is not the only show in town. Okay? For people that are familiar with uh, events that have occurred in, say, the San Francisco Bay Area or Southern California, there are many other faults in addition to the San Andreas. So like the, the ones that we put up on the yes. screen. Yeah. So, for example, in the San Francisco Bay Area, the second 
most active fault is the Hayward Fault, which connects north of the San Francisco Bay to what's called the Rogers Creek. And I think Creek we put fault. that up on the screen. Wasn't that on the screen, the Hayward uh, Yeah, fault? so the Hayward yeah. and the Rogers Creek were both up there. Yeah. Um, just to put that in perspective, we haven't had very many yeah, historical large earthquakes, mm -hmm. right? But prior to 1906, the most damaging event in the San Francisco Bay Area took place in 1868. It damaged San Francisco so much that it was called, quote, the Great San Francisco Earthquake of 1868. But it took place on the Hayward Fault, which is the last major event in recorded history. So you're on saying the that the Fault. Hayward Fault, the Calaveras, the Rogers, and the Green Valley Fault, those are all equally, maybe not equally, but equally um, in terms of being not as active, but, but just as critical in the fact that these could erupt at any time and cause as much damage as if an earthquake happened on the San Andreas Fault. Well, this is absolutely true because when we talk about damage in an earthquake, we need to keep in mind that unlike the Hollywood sort of depictions of an earthquake where there's a big hole that opens in the ground and a gaping gash or things fall into the ocean, what is most damaging in an earthquake is that shaking. Right? Yes. And so there's very, very little damage from actual differential movement of the ground, but it's the shaking. So what's key about that is the shaking in an earthquake, that's just like sound waves traveling through ground. So the yeah. further away you get, say, from my voice, right, the softer my voice gets. And Same thing in a shaking, quake? Same thing in a quake. Ah. So that energy with distance, right, that's okay. why we didn't feel the shaking from the magnitude 9.3 in Indonesia because it's so far away, right. you see? So this is why the location, so if you're living near the Hayward Fault, very close to it, that is the most threatening fault to where you live, more than the San Andreas, even though the San Andreas is, is going to produce earthquakes a little bit more frequently. I think we do we have to take a break. Yeah. We're running on time. Yeah, got to take a break here. We're talking with John Wakabayashi, a geologist, a professor at Fresno State, an expert on earthquakes. Uh, he's been an expert uh, in this field for many, many years, knows exactly what he's talking about. A lot more video to show. I know we had a phone call here, but do call back, uh, 436 Me TV Option 11. We're back with our program here talking about Napa in just a moment. Considering solar? Whether you're ready to buy now or just exploring your options, the consultants at Solar Negotiators are here to help you. A call to Solar Negotiators is like calling five solar companies at once. You see, when local established solar contractors have gaps in their schedule, they call Solar Negotiators to fill them. Right now, get five years of panel cleaning and maintenance or $1,000 off your new solar panels. So stop wasting your time searching and call Solar Negotiators because when contractors compete for your business, you win. All right, back here on the program talking about the Napa earthquake. We do have a phone call. As we take that call, I want to roll some videotape of the earthquake destruction in Napa and take a look at some more uh, what's going on there. Good morning, caller. What's your quick question here? Caller? Yeah, quick question is uh, if, if we know that the uh, earthquakes are going to hit certain areas in due time eventually, uh, why is it that a lot of contractors build you know, like in the San Francisco, L.A. area, towers of buildings. And in my, me, myself, if I was a contractor, I go, I know that they want the tower to look, to bring in people and whatnot, but knowing that there is an earthquake possibility, why don't they continue to put uh, 20, 25 uh, story high uh, buildings? Uh, at, that That's my question to, to him where, uh, you know, okay. even a single uh, story or a uh, two-story uh, made of bricks will come come down no matter. Like right. he says, the shaking, not so much as, you know, the, the earthquake, but, I mean, the shaking part. I can remember uh, uh, here in Sanger where when I was, oh, I must have been 12 years old, <laughs> when there was an earthquake where I could see the the ground sort of like a wave, you know. and uh, But it's scary in the sense that, you know, a lot of people uh, here in the valley, yeah. Uh, uh, go through it, but not in the coastal areas like San Francisco and L.A. But yeah. I, another question okay. real quick is, like, in New York, do they have possibility of having earthquakes? All right. Thank you for the two questions. I appreciate it. Go ahead. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer those. I'm not an engineer, but I can tell you that the height of the building isn't necessarily 
so the higher the building does not necessarily mean it's less earthquake safe. So hmm. buildings can be engineered, and that's just what engineers study uh, uh, to withstand earthquakes and, and withstand a whole lot of shaking. And so the way that we build buildings here in California, in the United States, we have building codes that regulate how we build and what sort of standards we engineer to. Yeah. And these are, in fact, based in part on the seismic environment. So the building codes in New York are different than the building codes, say, in San Francisco. Now, being a geologist, um, as we have a, another call coming in now, uh, ant answer this question real quick before we take this call. Is New York susceptible as much as California uh, is to an earthquake? Well, the, yes and no. They, first of all, the likelihood of a major earthquake in New York in terms of, say, a magnitude 6 plus is exceedingly low. Okay, right. let's take this call real quick. Caller, go ahead, quickly. Caller? Hello, are you on the air? Whoops, wasn't very patient. But low in terms of the possibility of it happening on the East Coast. Yes, and, and the reason is that we don't have faults that are moving at anywhere near the rate. We don't really have much in the way. But do they have the faults, faults back East? Really small ones, and so let, let's say um, a, an average like a Hayward Fault could produce a magnitude 7 every 150, 200 years. Okay. Right? If you were to try to kick loose that same energy with the rate of activity in New York, it would be thousands upon thousands of years. But they've had earthquakes in like Pennsylvania, they've as had, I recall. Yeah, very small ones. Yeah, know, very small ones. Yeah. Hey, you brought a dry erase board. What, what were you going to try to show us well, here on this erase board uh, today? What I wanted to show was sort of this concept of we we have this, uh, we talk about earthquakes and their effects, and it's important right to there, realize buddy. that uh, earthquakes, again, as I, as I was describing before, that which causes the shaking are like sound waves going through solid rock. They go out. Right? And yeah. so as a result of that, right, the sound, it dissipates with distance, which, as I mentioned before, is why we didn't hear, we didn't feel the an Indonesian earthquake of 9-3. But, okay, also if we're at a given distance, right, if I have a loud voice, you hear me from further away, yeah. than if I have a soft voice. And my the, the volume of my voice would be like the magnitude of an earthquake. Let's take this call real quick. Go ahead, caller, quickly, what's your question? Yes, uh, I'm just wondering now with the drought the way it is and our water levels dropping as they are, you see a lot of photographs there with, with the uh, damage that is side to side and opening gaps there that are side to side and road and so forth. What's the danger now with the, the aquifers being so low that there is going to be great slumpage in terms of earthquakes, you know, ground just caving in? Boy, that's a great the, question. Uh, I was going to, I was going to think, I was going to ask you that question and I forgot. Caller, thank you very much. Is there any correlation between uh, the drought and... No, there's not. And however, when we withdraw water, right and the ground subsides because we withdraw water the ground does deform we have settlement mm. we have things like that yeah. that doesn't have to do with an earthquake but that can cause damage i mean Could if your foundation an earthquake? uh it won't cause a very large one okay there have been studies that have been done that said that some stresses on faults have changed a little bit, but not to the not yeah. anywhere near enough to cause a major dry earthquake. erase board. What were you going to show us on this before we go to break? So I was going to show you uh, sort of how earthquake hazard works, how okay. planners deal with it, how seismic geologists deal with it, and in so doing, also sort of outline some of the specific issues uh, that surround this okay. Napa earthquake. All right, go okay. ahead. Go ahead. Uh, can you do that in like a, a minute or two? Or well, you, you guys have to bear with me. I'm a really okay. terrible artist. All right. So I'm going to like do this little okay. San Francisco. All right. Bay you make thing. the drawing. We're going to go to and break, and then when we come back, you'll be done with the drawing, mm -hmm. and you're going to show us exactly what's going on. Our guest today is John Wakabayashi, a geologist, an expert in earthquakes, knows what knows exactly what's going on when it comes to Napa, San Francisco Bay Area, all over the West and East Coast. We're back with our program in just a moment. Frigidaire, it means the first electric refrigerator, the first compact electric range, 
Now, there's the Frigidaire Gallery Range with Symmetry Double Ovens. It's designed to cook multiple dishes at multiple temperatures so you can prepare the entire meal at the same time. Frigidaire, over 90 years of legendary innovation. See the full line of Frigidaire appliances at Ventura TV Electronics and Appliances. We're back here talking about the earthquake that took place in Napa on a Sunday morning, about 3.30 in the morning, and it shook everybody up in the Bay Area, specifically Napa. Uh, could be a billion dollars worth of damage there. Uh, John Wakabayashi, a geologist from Fresno State, is here. All right, you're done, kind of done with the drawing there. Hold that up, and I'll kind of move the microphone. Take that tight shot, if you would. Uh, maybe remove that Connect With Me Chiron so we can kind of see what uh, is going on here. Maybe slide this over. Okay, John, go ahead. Okay, so what I've done is, and, and, and viewers bear with me because I'm a really crummy artist, and, and this is just done off the top of my head. But I'm, I'm doing this to illustrate that we have several active faults in the San Francisco Bay Area. And those represent the right? red or blue lines. And these are the red lines. The blue line says the coastline. It's a really crummy San Francisco Bay. Okay, so the fault so lines are in red. Those fault lines are in red. Let's say this is San Francisco here. Okay. okay? And the Napa earthquake would be like here. Okay. okay. All right. And this, I'm going to put some little acronyms. That San Andreas fault here. Okay. This okay. is San Andreas. Tilt that forward a little bit. We're right. getting a little glare. Like there you go. This is the Hayward fault. Okay. Okay. This is the Calaveras. This is the Greenville. Okay. Okay. This is also the Calaveras. This is the Concord. This is the Green Valley, and this is the Rogers Creek. Wow, right. all of those are faults. All lines. of those are faults. Tilt that up forward all so that everybody can see that. Whoops. Are, right there, are right there. Are capable of producing damaging earthquakes. Okay. Uh -huh. Now, you'll notice I put this little dotted line in there, and the reason for that dotted line is Show where that is dotted line is. This right dotted there. line here is a region that is not as well understood as where these major, what we would call the major players. And it is this region that back in the late 90s I brought attention to because as we were looking at some geologic indicators of activity, I felt we were missing something in this area. And, and so what we're looking at is I believe there's a whole system of faults, the West Napa, the Carneros, Southampton, Lafayette, others. You guys don't have to remember those names. Just bear in mind that there's faults that go up through there. Okay. Uh, that are connected, you know, this earthquake occurred on one of those. And so what's the sort of the bigger picture implications for this? Well, if you're living in San Francisco or Marin County or Hayward or, or Oakland or something like that, you have other faults that are closer to you that are more damaging and just adding one more threat is not going to raise the threat or you don't have to engineer for anything in addition. However, if you are here, because mm -hmm. that's close to you, in the city of Napa, okay, or along here, this guy is closer to you than the Rogers Creek or the San Andreas, and hence, this is a, a very significant local concern. And that'll cause you more problems if you're closer to those any one of those faults. Caller, you're on the air. Go ahead. Uh, that's very interesting. Do we have faults like that in the San Joaquin Valley? And do we have a fault that would be a 6.0 or bigger in the valley? Could he draw us a little diagram, or is there not very many there? Um, well, so the, uh, that's actually a really good question, yeah. and uh, because for people outside of California, they think of all of California as being just this really scary place that's menaced by earthquakes. <laughs> and, and folks somewhere say, well, we have... Our hurricanes, you guys have your earthquakes. But hey, not all places in California are equal. We in the valley have our, the nearest active fault is very far from us. Are we immune uh, to anything happening here? We are not immune, but the odds that we are going to be shaken significantly here during our lifetime, during the next hundred years, are very, very small. Even if the big, the so-called quote, <laughs> I've been hearing this since I was a kid, the big one hit San Francisco, we're not gonna get much damage here. We won't because it's quite far away. Hmm. Right? So, and, okay, the question uh, I asked you yesterday on the phone, I've been hearing this too as a kid. 
uh, and this is what 50 something years. Mm -hmm. When the big one hits, Los Angeles is gonna is gonna break off, go into the ocean, as will San Francisco. True or false? Very false. And uh, so, as I mentioned, the main threat in an earthquake is just the shaking. Okay? Yeah. We don't get big ground breakage. Big things don't move around huge yeah. distances as they do in the movies. Caller, you're on the Nothing's air. Nothing's falling into the sea. Go ahead. Caller? Oops, lost them. Okay, well, that's good news that nothing will be falling into the sea. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because we've been hearing that for a generation, and it's good to hear it from somebody who knows this is not going to happen. When you go to San Francisco, don't worry. There might be a quake, but you're not going to fall into the ocean. That's correct. If there's damage in San Francisco, and there will be in a major earthquake that is nearby, uh, it will be from the shaking. It won't be because San Francisco has suddenly become Atlantis. Will we, will we ever see anything like uh, what happened in 1906? Will San Francisco be destroyed? Uh, no. I mean, an earthquake just like 1906 will occur. It's, it's inevitable. In a matter of time. It's a matter of time. It will occur. But, you know, we've learned an awful lot about mm -hmm. engineering since 1906. Yeah. Hey, a good friend of ours uh, over in Napa was hurt uh, uh, in terms of his business, not physically, but his bi I talked to him this morning on the phone. I want to let's put, roll some of those photos that he sent. Arthur Hartunian, a former Fresno resident, owns the Napa Valley Distillery. I want to put some of those still photos up on the screen and show some of the damage. Uh, that's the Napa Valley Distillery. He had, you know, significant damage there, John. He had over $100,000 worth of damage. But he said on the phone today that he's thankful because some of these businesses have lost millions. I saw on the news over the weekend where you had this one distillery had barrels coming down uh, that were hanging, and they lost vintage wine that wasn't even for sale worth millions of dollars. So no surprise to you, but why are we surprised? Well, I, I think... Here's, here's uh, the situation with earthquakes as a Californian. I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, earthquakes are inevitable, but our memory is very short. All right, caller, you're on the air. Go ahead. Yes, John, we're talking about earthquakes, correct? Uh, yes. Okay, I'm, I'm glad that he cleared up that we're not all going to fall in the water. But <laughs> as far as San Francisco is one way and L.A. is at the bottom, where do we as Fresno stand as far as earthquakes go? Yes, we were just getting into that. Fresno and, and the Central Valley in general, we're very far from the nearest active fault. As we get toward the southern end of the San Joaquin Valley, toward Bakersfield, we get closer to some uh, active faults, and Bakersfield was rocked by an earthquake in 1952. Okay? But here in Fresno, we are very, very far. We will feel a distant large earthquake on the San Andreas Fault, but it will not, the shaking will not be severe enough to really cause major damage. Those here. were incredible pictures that, that you were seeing there from the um, Napa Valley Distillery, owned by Arthur Hartunian. He's a former Fresno resident that uh, moved over there to Napa and owns a business uh, over there now. Hey, I want to mention also, John, um, and I do hope that you come back. Uh, maybe you can be a regular here. We, we love the fact that you're here today talking about this incredible stuff. Uh, in August alone, look how many earthquakes there were. Peru, Chile, Iran, China, Micronesia, Indonesia. Does that have any correlation to what happened in Napa? Uh, no, it doesn't. Uh, oh, the okay. events on the, on the other side of the globe are not physically connected to processes that happen here in earthquakes. Uh, also, if you statistically were to look at the energy released in earthquakes around the world through time, through as long as we've had instrumental records, there's no uptick in activity right now. We seem to hear a lot more about it nowadays for two reasons. One is globally our population is growing, and two, our technology of communication has gotten better and better. So we hear about things much more readily around the globe than we did, say, 30, 40, 50 years ago. John, sadly, we're out of time, but would you come back again? 
Oh, I'd, I'd be happy to. All right. We'd love to have you. I love your expertise and knowledge and incredible knowledge. And our thanks today to our previous guest from the Stanton Printing uh, Company, John Wakabayashi, a geologist at Fresno State. Our guest today talking about the Napa earthquake. Thank you for him and taking his time. Tomorrow, we're going to be talking sports. Hey, there's this fan club here in California. It all has to do with the Pittsburgh Steelers. What? They're going to be our guests tomorrow back with another edition of Connect With Me. See you then. Have a great day.